Hi, I'm Kamala Zulfagari. I'm executive director of Street Grace in Georgia. Hi, I'm Jamie Carruthers. I'm the vice president of anti-demand and policy for Street Grace and the Texas executive director. So thank you so much for joining us for this expert speaker series. Really, our goal of this series is just so that we can introduce you to and let you hear from some of the absolute experts in this field. We're excited today to be joined by experts from two different attorney general's offices, both here in Georgia and in Texas. Um, in a little bit, I'm going to talk to Hannah Palmquist, who is in charge of the human trafficking unit for the Georgia attorney general's office. But we're actually, I'm gonna start by turning it over to Jamie so he can start talking in Texas. Thanks, Kamala. I'm gonna be talking to Brody Barks, assistant attorney general, for the Texas Office of the Attorney General. Brody does policy, he does trial, he does attorney training. So we're gonna cover a lot of ground. That sounds great. So let's get started. We are fortunate this morning to be joined with by Brody Burks. Brody is a longtime Assistant Attorney General with the Texas Attorney General's Office. He's also their legislative liaison and he's their training attorney. Good morning, Brody. Good morning. So such a pleasure to have you with us. If you don't mind, would you take a couple of minutes and just tell the audience about you and your career path and um, kind of how you got here? Sure. So my name's Brody Burks. Uh, I grew up in Texas. I'm, I'm originally from here. Uh, kind of did a, a brief jaunt over to Washington, D.C. for about six years. That's where I got my law degree, but came back to Texas. And I've been working in public service ever since. I spent about a decade as an assistant attorney general uh, or an assistant district attorney, mostly in rural counties. Um, so counties with 25,000 people in them. And then uh, here in the last five years, I've been working in state public policy at the governor's office and now at the attorney general's office. Um, as you mentioned, I wear a lot of hats here. I do uh, prosecution. I've got some cases that I'm currently involved in trying. I do training and I'm also uh, doing the legislative work. Right now we are in the middle of our legislative session. Texas is kind of strange. We meet for six months every other year. So it's pretty busy when we meet and we're right in the thick of that right now. So a lot going on. Just a thing or two. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so glad you could join us. Um, so let's start with the legislative session. I know it's, it's been very busy. Um, talk, talk to us a little bit about what trafficking legislation and, and related legislation looks like this session in Texas. Sure. So we are very fortunate. We have spent um, about 10 or 15 years really developing relationships with our uh, legislators here in Texas, both in the Texas House and the Texas Senate. We have a bunch of really great allies um, that over the years we have been able to cultivate, educate, and have really gotten on our side and, and been leaders in the state on uh, trafficking efforts. So uh, we're fortunate this year there's nothing big and huge that we have to go after. Uh, we have an omnibus uh, anti-trafficking bill that we are working on, um, but most of that ends up being kind of legislative fixes. Uh, the one big uh, legislative uh, work that we are doing is an anti-grooming statute. Uh, that's something that we have worked with police and, and law enforcement. It's very difficult to intervene prior to a, a young woman or a young man becoming a victim of trafficking. And so what we're trying to do is create a grooming statute that will uh, allow law enforcement to intervene before those uh, outcomes actually happen. So that's been one of our big focuses. Uh, and then some expansion of our outcry and extraneous offense evidence to allow juries to hear uh, sort of the whole picture of a trafficking situation. One of the things that we know is that traffickers often use force, they use fraud, coercion. These are the elements of trafficking. And those often become other offenses that are sometimes excluded from trials. So we're, we're making sure that prosecutors are able to tell that whole story, really discuss uh, the full reality of trafficking and why someone may be reluctant to outcry, may not act like the jury expects them to, uh, and really give that context. And the last thing that we're really working on is child pornography enhancements. The Texas child pornography statute, like most, were written uh, in years ago in an age where child pornography was traded through physical images. 
And so there is a presumption of uh, intent to distribute child pornography if you have multiple copies of the same image, like multiple uh, uh, printed photographs. And we know that that's not how child pornography is, is exchanged any longer. So we're working with our legislators um, and working to change that scheme that instead recognizes the harm of multiple images where people have hundreds or thousands of child pornography images and uh, really address the sentencing scheme that way rather than this antiquated idea of, of printed physical images. So a sliding scale, but adjusted for the sort of new reality of how this crime is committed. That's exactly right. Um, just acknowledging that the more images someone has, the more harm that they are actively doing with that trading, um, that they are re-victimizing more and more uh, individuals through their collection of child pornography. And I think with legislative work, that's a constant thing as, you know, the bad guys evolve and their tactics evolve, particularly alongside technology. We see that, right? We have to legislatively evolve as well. Sure. And we see that uh, with things like trying to get in evidence from social media, um, trying to get evidence from social media. We know that these are the ways that uh, traffickers are reaching out and grooming and, and keeping their traffic victims um, in those situations. And so we really have to be uh, aware of what our limitations are and then go to the legislature and ask for, uh, ask for fixes to help address those. So a couple of legislative things that are specific issues I'd like to talk about. Um, one is the illicit massage business issue, right? That I would say it's it's it's, it's a, the shame of Texas, but it's really the shame of every state in the in the union, right? Every single state has this problem. Of course, we have the most in, in Harris County outside of any county in the nation, except for in cal counties in California. So it's a real problem here. It's a real, to be fair, it's a real problem elsewhere. And even more fair, I think Texas really has tried to address this, but. Um, what are you seeing on that on that frontier? Because I know we have a lot of viewers who are concerned about this with over 900 in Texas. Um, obviously, it's it's the most open, what I like to call the most open and notorious form of human trafficking and exploitation um, current today or available today. Sure. So one of the difficulties that we have found, um, there's really two. One is one is kind of up and coming. So the first difficulty is identifying buyers rather than individual women who are working in these businesses, right? Um, going after going after women who are either explicitly being trafficked or uh, in very sort of marginal consent cases is not effective. Uh, Texas has recently made buying sex a felony. That has really been an effective tool in going after the Johns and doing demand reduction work. But it leaves us without a whole lot of criminal tools to go after these illicit massage businesses. And so one of the things that we're doing is focusing not exclusively on just the kind of kick in the door, do a raid, arrest a bunch of people uh, sort of work, but rather what are the other ways, the alternatives that we have? Uh, one of them is to do uh, really complex in financial investigations. Uh, we have an investigator here at our office who uh, was a financial investigator in a previous life and is absolutely wonderful to have. But if you don't happen to have a boon on your staff, that can be a very daunting thing to do. So one of the things that we've really focused on is providing civil remedial tools to local jurisdictions so that they can go after these either as a common law nuisance or uh, under the Deceptive Trade Practices Act, even with Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation regulatory actions. So these are things that we can do on the civil side that don't require that sort of criminal work. One of the nice things about this is we can do landlord engagement programs, and we may not even have to get into a courtroom. We're finding we've, we've got a landlord engagement program that about a third of the time simply contacting and educating the landlord of a strip mall or an individual business or whatever it is, educating them about what is going on in their, uh, in their location is enough to get a lease canceled, not renewed, uh, to, to get 
some sort of performance bond, those sorts of things that make it much more difficult for illicit massage businesses to exist and do the kinds of things that they're doing. So we found that that is a really effective tool outside of the criminal justice system. No, that makes a lot of sense. And I feel like I've been a little remiss. I probably should have explained to the audience we're jumping in. What we're talking about is storefront operations, sometimes involving human trafficking, sometimes just prostitution and other forms of exploitation, um, purporting to be massage. And of course, they're not. They're generally unlicensed. They generally don't meet any of the Texas um, statutory or regulatory requirements for massage. They bring women in, particularly from overseas, confiscate visas, and they're forced to work there and, and have sex with uh, with random men um, from while well, they're here, right? And so uh, what we're talking about here is remedies to sort of stop this and abate this and, and get rid of this. And and, and one thing that I would add to that is we're finding a lot of times these illicit massage businesses, there will be several allied businesses. There may be a storefront in San Angelo or Austin or Dallas, but it's allied with owned by um, the same person, a family member of one that's in another location. And so one of the challenges that we are finding is that oftentimes the women who are involved are being moved between those locations at fairly regular intervals. And it makes it very difficult for us then to find witnesses, witnesses that want to cooperate with us because um, they often make far more money in this than they could uh, back in their country of origin. And so those are real barriers to enforcement. And so going after it in that civil, uh, that civil way, we can go against the business itself. And it's not as dependent on identifying a cooperating witness that we then may have um, visa issues or uh, language barrier issues, issues of consent. So if we can go after that business, bring the landlords on our side, bring those neighboring tenants on our side, that can be a really, uh, a really effective tool. That's fantastic to hear. And I think you've identified really, y'all are working on what commonly is understood to be, you know, probably the two weakest points of that industry, right? The commercial, the least commercial space by talking to the landlord, explain to them, hey, do you really want to get crosswise with all of us? We know what's going on. Um, and also the financial issue, right? Those are the two, the two weakest points. They've got to move their money somewhere and they've got to handle that money. And of course, they have to have a place to operate out of. So that's really heartening to hear that. You, know, you had mentioned that Texas, um, in 2021, we made sex buying a state jail felony on the first offense. We're the only state in the nation to have done that. Is It is was such a massive achievement that so many people um, really helped with to get that done because it took years. Um, what Are there any other sort of effects you're seeing from this increase in our sex buying penalty? How has that impacted your work? Sure. So uh, let me give you two really different perspectives of what that sort of uh, enhancement to punishment gives. So one is from my work as an assistant attorney general here in the AG's office, that really helps us go after, um, go after demand reduction. If we can start educating Johns, hey, look, you're going to get a felony on your record if you do this. That, um, that enhancement from, oh, it's just a misdemeanor, I'll just be booked in, booked out, to no, you may spend some time in prison. Uh, that's a great demand reduction tool, especially because one of the things that we see is these are not uh, the Johns, uh, especially in illicit massage businesses, they are not hardened criminals, right? These are not men who, for whom a, a felony is no big deal. So that is a, a very useful tool. My perspective as an assistant district attorney, uh, it's, it's in some ways the same as, as we enhance DWIs. As a DA, it gave me so many more tools to put someone on felony probation. And sometimes probation is a bad word because we wanna see you know bad guys go to jail. But when we have that tool of felony probation that we can put someone on probation for five years or 10 years, send them to a cognitive behavioral therapy inpatient center, really do some of that work to educate this person and keep them from becoming a repeat sex buyer, that's an extraordinary tool 
that uh, the move from misdemeanor probation and very limited, uh, very limited tools and consequences to felony probation, where we have a whole lot more things that we can do and work with this person and really address it at that source of the sex buyer, that, that's a huge, huge boon to local prosecutors. It really, really is. And I think you really put your finger on a couple of things that are near and dear to us at Street Grace, which is one, getting buyers out of this market or getting them broke, breaking that buying cycle or disincentivizing them or however it's done, it's going to shrink the entire marketplace because they're fueling the market. And the other side of it is while we're a while we're an anti-buyer, anti-demand organization, you know, we understand as you obviously do as well that, you know, buyers typically have a tremendous amount of trauma in their past. That's kind of why they're on this path. They have a lot of the same adverse childhood experiences that measure trauma that um, prostitute individuals have, right? And so <clears throat> being able, while harsh penalties are harsh, right? And we have them for a reason. They also kind of open this, the door to more services and more outreach and, hey, let's stop this problem, right? Rather than, than um, continuing on, pleading them out and letting this behavior continue. And it better for them, better for their families as well. So harsh medicine, but sometimes it works. Absolutely. Now, I don't. I would like to also uh, take talk a little bit about your trial work. You're also a trial attorney with the Attorney General's Office. I don't want to obviously get any specifics or ask you questions you can't answer about trial work. If you could kind of give us a general purview of what that looks like, and and I think everybody would really interested. You know, how do you balance all this legislative work with um, a, a trial docket? I, it blows my mind. Sure. So uh, the way that uh, the Texas Attorney General's office works, for those that don't know, we do not have original criminal jurisdiction in trafficking cases. We come in at the request of a local district attorney who either asks us uh, to come in simply as a resource for them, or because they have to uh, recuse themselves for a particular reason. So uh, I currently have four cases on my docket. Uh, three of them are assist cases. That typically is very small counties. Uh, one of them is a jurisdiction that has the local elected district attorney and uh, they have one assistant and that's it. And they are covering misdemeanors, felonies, juveniles, civil commitments, everything. And so this is a local jurisdiction that really just doesn't have the resources to work the kind of uh, felony first degree trafficking case that, that we're working in that jurisdiction. So they called our office. We are more than happy to, to help. Uh, I've covered some hearings for them. I can file some motions. I'm going to assist in the trial. We also have um, investigative resources. Our victim in that case, as often happens, had kind of disappeared. We did not have contact with her. So the local DA was able to call me and say, hey, what can we do? And uh, we put an investigator on it, sent him all over the state knocking on doors, talking to family members. So that is the kind of thing that we can do for local jurisdictions. I also have one case where the local district attorney had previously represented that defendant when um, they were in private practice as a defense attorney. They were conflicted out. They couldn't, they simply could not prosecute the case. So they recused themselves. And then our office was appointed to come in and be the prosecutor for that, for that case. So that's the way that we get involved. We have seven attorneys here at the office at the moment. Uh, we we do kind of little bits of everything. Like I said, I do training. We have another attorney who does uh, civil work. Then we have trial attorneys as well. Balancing it is uh, largely a point of keeping a good calendar, trying not to trying not to miss anything. And I, I have an absolutely wonderful legal assistant, Jessica, who keeps me on top of where I need to be. And and what I need to be doing. So I could not do it uh, without the rest of the team, without the legal assistance, without um, my boss really supporting what it is I'm doing and where I'm going. And sometimes that means that I'm driving around the state in one of our state vehicles with uh, congressional hearings on my cell phone playing in the passenger seat. So you just kind of uh, adapt to what we have. Well, we appreciate everything that you do, and that that's that's a busy that's a busy schedule. Change gears a little bit. Going to go into kind of a wide ranging question here, kind of on all the all all the different hats that you wear. 
when you're looking at the Texas landscape and trafficking in Texas, you know, what would you categorize as the biggest challenges we still face in anti-trafficking work from any perspective? Sure. So there are some challenges that uh, we can really address and some we just have to work with, right? Uh, one of the ones that we can really address and, and is a big part of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is education. Talking about the myths and realities of trafficking, that trafficking is not, um, not the sorts of things that you see on social media, zip ties on your car handle at Target, right? It is traffickers who are targeting very vulnerable uh, youths, women, children, and really working their way into their lives, often through social media, sometimes in person, but um, recognizing how trafficking actually happens. That's something that we do a lot of education on, lots of training on. We also have uh, training that we do on just kind of like, how do you get some of this evidence into trial? Again, it's a lot of social media. Our investigators do lots of training to uh, law enforcement around the state. How do you actually get a Facebook message that's encrypted out of Facebook and into something that can be, uh, be introduced in court? A lot, of, a lot of that work is really vital to what we do. Then there are challenges that you just have to work on. Um, I mentioned earlier, we had, a, we had a victim who kind of disappeared on us for a while. Um, it is recognizing that we are dependent on the relationships we are able to build with our victims and witnesses. And that without them prosecuting cases is nearly impossible. And so it's being trauma informed ourselves, recognizing the kinds of trauma that our victims have gone through, recognizing the kinds of trauma that we go through, trying cases, looking at this evidence, and um, really being aware of how do we work together with law enforcement, with our victims, with uh, our local partners to get to resolutions, using all the tools in our toolbox and, and really just acknowledging how difficult human trafficking cases can be to try. I appreciate that thoughtful answer. That kind of leads naturally into our, our final question, which um, assume you had magical powers and you could change one thing in Texas, right? Um, to alter the landscape of trafficking, to make your job easier, make you know the, the, your partners you work with all around the state, their job easier. What would that one thing be? And I know this is a hard question. So honestly, we're working on it this session. And that one thing is uh, our outcry and extraneous offense evidence. Oftentimes, uh, we have victims who have made very good outcries to one person, and then they just shut down. And you may get them on the stand, but you will never get the kind of detail or context that they told that one person that they really trusted. Um, it is extraordinarily traumatizing for a victim who may be uh, a teenage girl to get in front of 12 jurors, the judge, the court reporter, myself, the defense attorney, and the person who victimized her, often repeatedly, and talk about being sexually assaulted. Uh, none of us would want to do that. And that's something that we routine, routinely ask of our victims. So the ability to go into outcry and extraneous offense evidence for uh, victims who are under 18, not just under 14, I think that's going to make an enormous difference to prosecutors around the state. So if I could do any one thing right now, it would be to snap, snap my fingers and get, uh, get that particular bit of legislation passed and out. Beyond that, a lot of this is really awareness, uh, awareness of what the warning signs are of trafficking, uh, awareness by parents of how trafficking happens and how to uh, intervene and keep their children safe, awareness uh, from, our, from our law enforcement and juries and judges of what sort of trauma our victims are going through. I think we just have to keep talking about it and we, we got to keep talking about it till we kind of go hoarse, but that's that's the way that we're going to have to approach this problem. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, and, and education is key. Well, Brody, that's all the time we have this morning. I thank you so much for taking time out of your obviously extremely busy schedule to meet with us and, and talk to the 
talk to our audience about, you know, about your job and how this works and then the Texas system and all these fantastic insights you provided them. We wouldn't have another way. So thank you so much for being part of our summer expert series. Thank you all. Thanks, Brody. Well, that was great. And, you know, I know we really appreciate so much Brody taking the time to talk to us and, you know, a couple of things I just want to touch, touch back on real quick, Kamala. I'm so excited about their omnibus bill. That's actually Senate bill 1527 by Senator Huffman. It's passed. It's done. It's going to be, unless it's going to either be signed into law in the gov by the governor or become law. So excited about that. And just want everyone to know the child grooming portion of that bill that, that Brody uh, stressed there. That's our bill. Street Grace uh, submitted that bill through the Houston Rescue and Restore Coalition. Also, the Houston Rescue and Restore Coalition Park Committee had a lot of input into that bill. So together, we were able to craft something that is truly unique. And I was glad to hear him talk about the pre-harm aspect about that because Street Grace were really moving in that direction. We want to give law enforcement and prosecutors remedies that can be used before the harm happens to the child. Let's identify these bad actors immediately and take action against them. And also, it's just thrilled... We're just so we're just thrilled to hear um, the positive effects of our increasing of sex buying to a state jail felony on the first offense. You know, that was a huge land, uh, watershed event in Texas. And um, just great to hear that, you know, we're reaping dividends from that. Right. And as you know, you know, you've been working with us to match that in Georgia. In Georgia, we are almost to the finish line of making all purchasing of sex a felony. And so obviously reach out to any of you who want to learn how to help us make that happen. Definitely reach out to us after this, but I want to go on now and we're about to talk to, I'm about to get to talk to Hannah Palmquist. She is the assistant attorney general over prosecuting human trafficking for the Georgia attorney general's office. One thing that's different in Georgia from what Brody just talked about is the attorney general's office does have original concurrent jurisdiction in cases. And so they get to work a lot more cases. So I'm excited to let Hannah tell us more about some of the work they're doing and the amazing verdicts that they're getting, the justice they're getting. So um, I'm going to go ahead and start talking to Hannah now. Um, so welcome, Hannah. I really appreciate you joining us. Um, and I'd love it if you could start and just talk a little bit about who you are, your job, but also why you prosecute, how you got to this role with uh, the Adjo Georgia Attorney General's Office and working with Attorney General Carr. First, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to talk about our work and we're super excited for the partnership that we have with your organization. So I've been a prosecutor my entire career. I graduated from Emory Law in 2012, and I became a prosecutor in DeKalb County here in Georgia. And then I worked with um, Cobb County, again, here in the metro Atlanta area. I worked there for seven years. After I started in Cobb County, I spent about a year on the tri trial line prosecuting everything from armed robberies to burglaries. And after about a year, I was asked to move to the sex crimes unit, which there was called the special victims unit. It was crimes against women and children. Upon going there, I just found how really rewarding prosecuting those cases are because you get to take someone who is put um, in that position and help them get to a position of power and have their voice be heard when they were silenced before. And I found that to be a really rewarding experience. But what I found during my time there when I was prosecuting everything from rape to child molestation and then some human trafficking is that human trafficking was absolutely the most difficult kind of sex crime to prosecute. They just required so much more time, um, a much more in-depth investigation. You had problems with those cases that you don't have in other cases. And so in 2019, the opportunity came up to join Attorney General Chris Carr's office, where they were going to start the state's first um, entire unit that would prosecute human trafficking across the state. So I jumped at that opportunity to take on the challenge of how to address the problems with prosecuting human trafficking. So as you know, I'm super excited about this today. You know, personally, when I was in the Georgia Attorney General's office prosecuting human trafficking, and there wasn't a unit, it was just me. Now, 
the work you are doing, the scope and size of the work that you're doing is just amazing. So again, super excited about hearing about it today. So can you talk to people a little bit about the size of your unit, the scope of your unit? Um, Because different AG's offices do different things. Some do policy, some do awareness, not all of them prosecute. And you guys are doing tons of it. So talk a little bit about that. And Pamela, you touched on it when you said when you were here, it was just you. It absolutely takes a team. So I'm one of three prosecutors, but we also have three investigators who are certified law enforcement officers. We also have three analysts. And what they focus on is the technological evidence. So one of the most important aspects of a human trafficking case is technology. Because if you don't have a cooperative victim or cooperative witnesses, you can always overcome that with the right technology evidence. So we really focus on that. We also have an amazing administrative assistant that keeps the team running. And we have a full-time victim advocate um, who works to provide much needed services to victims of these crimes. And it's, it's amazing. I feel like every time we talk, you've added another staff member. And I know that's greatly due to AG Carr's focus and Governor Kemp's focus on human trafficking. Um, One thing that we know you've done so much of and, of course, are super excited about because of our focus on demand is you've gone after um, the buyers, the demand that fuels trafficking. Um, Can you talk a little bit about actually before we get to that, how does the case get to your office? Why would a case be prosecuted by the AG's office versus a local district attorney? That's a great question. So under this Georgia statute, we have concurrent jurisdiction with local county district attorneys. And that means not less than, not greater than, it's concurrent. So we really focus on a collaborative approach. We get cases one of two ways. One is that we actually investigate the case ourselves. We take a very proactive approach. For example, um, we had a child who Nick Mick was posting online about because she was missing. Our investigator, upon hearing a tip that she might be in our area, actually went out and located that child. So we had that case from day one when the child was located. We got that case um, all the way to court. Um, And then another way that we get the cases, if we haven't worked them ourselves, is we are requested to take them. So the local law enforcement agency or our state investigative agency, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, or a federal agency can call up our office and ask us to prosecute. And occasionally as well, a district attorney's office may call us and ask us to prosecute a case because their prosecutors don't have the luxury of specializing. They're trying everything from DUI to homicides. So we're all always happy to help in help um, step in and help out when needed. So can you touch a little bit more on why specialization in trafficking is so helpful and important? Why are these cases so hard? These cases are complex. So when you have other sorts of sex crimes like child molestation and rape, the, the common saying amongst prosecutors, which I'm sure you heard is, at least I don't need any evidence stickers, because you didn't have evidence. There wasn't going to be information in a phone. There weren't going to be eyewitnesses. You have your perpetrator and you have your victim. And so while those cases are difficult to argue to a jury, you simply have a handful of witnesses and that's all you really put up in front of the jury. These cases are much more complex in the sense that You have a victim, you may have many victims, you may have a case that instead of occurring on one specific occasion at one particular time and place, it occurred over the course of many weeks or months or even years. It traveled county to county, which also makes local prosecution um, different. That's certainly a hindrance. Um, You have complex electronic evidence. The way that we discover traffickers and prove these cases is always through technology. So the beauty of specialization is we get to try it over and over and over again and come up with sort of a foolproof formula for what works. The other piece of this that makes it more complicated is the victims, due to the trauma that they've been through and the needs that they have, 
also require a lot more time, a lot more thought has to go into the services that they require and their preparation for court. So that's also a big piece of specialization on these cases. So you've you talked a lot about technology. Um, and one thing we're doing this summer is a whole series on protecting kids online. Um, how many of your cases, what percentage of your cases involve a trafficker meeting their person online or using online methods to recruit their victims? Um, and then also just how, what ways, we talk about redeeming technology. In what ways are you using technology for good in these cases? Answering the first question, well over half of victims on our cases are meeting their perpetrators online. It's a very common recruitment tactic to reach out to kids online and to groom them. They don't immediately say, do you want to come have sex for money? They initially start a friendship or some sort of purported romantic relationship to get the child to leave the home. And then the grooming continues and eventually becomes trafficking. Certainly that occurs in well over half of our cases. Now speaking about the positives of technology, the beauty of technology is that when text messages are sent or location data is registered with a cell phone company or with Google, it's there and it's not changing. So if your victim is uncooperative, if witnesses are going to lie for the perpetrator, the electronic evidence isn't going to lie. And one example I use is our very first trial as a unit, we had um, the victim take the stand. And in response to every single question, she said, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And I said to her, is there anything you do remember or you do know? And she looked straight at the jury and she said, yes, that I was never trafficked. And that was the extent of her testimony. But what we did is we moved on and we put up the technology, we put up the electronic evidence, and both of the traffickers in trial in that case were both convicted because the electronic evidence was enough to overcome the fact that the victim wasn't ready to talk about what happened to her. And and that's obviously an amazing story. <laughs> um <laughs> And one thing I know we've worked for so long in the field on is to be able to not rely on a victim who has been traumatized as a prosecutor. And so being able to overcome that um, is, it's just really amazing the work that your unit has been doing to bring justice. Um, let's talk about switch over to buyers because Everybody recognizes that seller trafficker as a trafficker, but sometimes we've let buyers just go by the name John, like this anonymous name, person doing no harm, just not really a factor in it. Why have you gone after buying? How are you doing it? Um, talk about that. We're firm believers in the idea that if people weren't buying kids for sex, nobody would be selling them for sex. It's the simple idea of supply and demand. And in Georgia, we're really trying um, to attack that problem. I believe historically, the reason it's been difficult to go after buyers is they are so anonymous. They're only with the victim for a very brief amount of time. And that evidence is going to disappear very quickly. So if a case isn't discovered very quickly, which they often aren't, that evidence is gone. I had a moment a couple of years ago when it just really clicked for us. We proactively went out searching for a missing child who we believed was being trafficked. Rather than waiting for her to report and investigating something historical, we went out and found her. We found her in a hotel, recovered her and immediately preserved the hotel's surveillance video, seized a phone, dug through the trash to find multiple used condoms to submit for DNA. And we ended up charging a couple of sellers, but nine buyers for a simple 24 hour period. And what clicked for us is that evidence is gonna disappear quickly 
So we need to proactively investigate cases, get out there and find these kids who are being trafficked, actively stop the trafficking. And then it's a heck of a lot easier um, to discover those cases. The other thing that, that we advocate for is simply listen to the statute. We have an incredible statute in Georgia that says lack of knowledge of age is not a defense and solicitation is trafficking. So it's on law enforcement and prosecutors to listen to the statute and to accept that and to not say, oh, she was advertised as 18. That doesn't count. No wonder our statute it does. And we do need to hold people accountable for it to be a deterrent. Obviously, you've got ongoing cases that you can't talk about, but what can you talk about as far as some of your cases, some of your outcomes? And there's been some really exciting ones happening. Certainly. One very recent resolution, it was our, our best outcome on a plea that we've received. We got a life sentence on a trafficker. We actually had him plea in two different counties, and he got a life sentence in each county. So the story of that case, I really applaud law enforcement because it started with a traffic stop, as these cases often do. Someone who had received training in detecting signs of human trafficking engaged in the traffic stop of the defendant. And next to him, he had a child, a teenage girl in his passenger seat who hid her identity, her age. It turns out she was a runaway. The investigation that ensued um, uncovered that she had been trafficked by this man in two different counties in the metro area. Because we're a statewide unit, we have jurisdiction in all counties in Georgia, all 159, and we prosecuted him in both. We also did our due diligence with finding buyers. So we, pro we found um, two sellers who had um, engaged in trafficking her in Fulton, as well as a buyer. And then we found in another county, um, we charged that same trafficker as well as two other buyers. And the outcome of that case is that the buyers received 25-year sentences, anywhere between 7 and 12 of those years in custody. So our highest sentence yet on a buyer is 25 to serve the first 12 years in custody because they were repeat buyers of the same child. And then the primary trafficker received a life sentence in each county. Um, so that was a success that we absolutely credit to law enforcement partnerships. It also is such an example of how important proper training and awareness is, because if they had just been let go from that traffic stop, it's possible that she would still be trafficked today. So we're very grateful for that. Another recent success that we had is a case that we tried in the, another metro county um, a couple of months ago. We charged multiple buyers, but multiple sellers in that case. Every one of them uh, pled guilty, except for one who demanded a trial. We recently um, got him convicted at trial through the use of technology, and he is currently serving a 70-year sentence in prison. Wow. Which is actually longer than life. Uh, yes. That is really uh, just, it's amazing what, what has happened when people are dedicated, educated, and there's been training, and then also have the resources to do it. Um, we know that not all local jurisdictions have the resources, not even all states put the resources to this topic. Um, I know sometimes people think uh, tra Georgia's the most trafficking happens here. Atlanta happens, most trafficking happens here. Um, but I know we also put a lot of resources into identifying it. Which one of those do you think plays more into how many cases you have? They are all so important. They truly are because a lot of our cases come from that initial identification. But I will say based on my personal experience, the ability to specialize 
is so incredibly important. And I know that that is um, definitely a root cause of our success. We're very grateful for the fact that this um, unit was created, that it's statewide, that we don't have to pay attention to where the county line is because we know that traffickers don't, and that we get to come in every day just dedicated to investigating and prosecuting human trafficking and the specific challenges that come with those cases. So that, that issue of specialization is absolutely instrumental for us. And how about how are you seeing since you are statewide, how is training distributed throughout the state or how much does law enforcement training affect whether or not you're going to find a case in that area? First of all, when we conduct training, people know to call us. They know what other agencies are engaged in investigating these cases, and they know to reach out to them and call them. But also, we've seen it on multiple occasions where someone who successfully detected human trafficking in a traffic stop specifically cited training that they had received from one organization or another. So we're seeing real life examples of kids being recovered from trafficking due to training. I, and that's my experience is there's nothing quite more instantly seeing results than training law enforcement because they're out in the community and they get it once, once they've had that say the eye can't see what the mind can't conceive, once they understand what it is, they can really start to see it. Um, But it doesn't do any good to see it if they don't have the prosecutors there to prosecute it. What is one final thing you want to make sure everybody knows or understands or what you want to see grow in the future? What do you think one, one or two things would make the biggest difference? First, I think the message that this is possible is really important. When we first took on this task, it was certainly daunting. You know, what if victims don't cooperate? What if they don't show up? All of these challenges that that make us um, uncomfortable about these cases or hesitate to approach these cases. I think this is a success story of how it is absolutely possible. And I would just really encourage investigators and prosecutors to just lean into those problems and just know there are solutions, network with each other. Nobody has all of the resources that they want or need. That's a big lesson that I've learned. And you would be amazed at what other people have done. I pick up the phone probably 10 times a day to ask someone for help or ask someone for a resource. It's all about knowing who to call. So a message that I would send is no other agencies, know who to call, network with each other, um, help each other with the resources that you have, reach out when you don't have a resource, and you'd be impressed at how much can be accomplished if agencies work together on this issue. So finally, I mean, for our Um, We have, in addition to, you know, those of us who are working together in the non-law enforcement capacity to end trafficking, a lot of law enforcement, um, how would a law enforcement officer get in touch with your office? Um, Because as you said, it's all about knowing who to call. um, So we work together to address these cases. We are happy to be available um, for assistance for anyone who might require it, whether it's law enforcement or a prosecuting agency, and they can simply go to the Georgia Attorney General's website and we can be reached at the contact information there. Just ask for the Human Trafficking Unit, and you can specifically ask for a prosecutor or an investigator, depending on your specific need at the time. Thank you so much. That is actually a very valuable website and resource. I end up sending people there frequently. Um, But thank you, Hannah, not only for joining us and sharing with us your expertise, but really for the work you're doing, because we're just seeing amazing things. So Thank you for having me. Have a good day. You too. Bye. So I'm so excited about the work that the Georgia Attorney General's Office is doing and all of the prosecutions and the justice, they are helping bring about justice. I'm also super excited about all that she said about technology because, you know, I know one of our focuses is on redeeming technology 
We know technology is used for evil and it can also be used for good. A lot of our programs involve technology. So it's so interesting to hear from Hannah how they are using technology to bring about justice and to get some really strong verdicts. Yeah, I really loved hearing about that too, Kamala. And it was really interesting for me to see, and I think for our audience to see how Texas and Georgia, they're doing some of the same things. They're doing some things that are a little bit different. And I'm just glad Street Grace can bring bring everyone together. And I'm glad that our organization can serve as sort of this uh, facilitator for cross-state collaboration. It's a really, it's a beautiful thing. Absolutely. So thank you all for joining us for this first of our expert speaking series. We want to bring the experts straight to you so that you can learn from them, learn how you can make a difference. As you heard, both of these experts talked about the importance of education and how much they see a difference. So we're flashing our email addresses on the screen. Definitely reach out to us if you have any questions, if you want to learn how to be more involved. I'm going to put a plug in for Georgia specifically if you want to help get this piece of legislation passed because it is right there at the finish line. We have a two-year session, so we're working on it right now in the summer, trying to ensure that we also have the law as Texas does, that all purchasing is a felony, is treated like the like the crime that it is, the crime that fuels the exploitation of children. Senate Bill 36. Thank you. <laughs> Have a good day. Thanks, everybody.